Bartona Kármos vagyok. És én vagyok ennek az épületnek az új tulajdonosa. A fővárosi önkormányzat határozata értelmében ez év augusztusától a Bartonek Holding veszi a kezelésből az épület komplexumot. Jól számolom, önök az fél évre illegálisan tartózkodnak a lakóingatlanba, ami kettőtől négy hónapig terjedő feltétlenül szabadságvesztésre is büntethető. Én most nem értem, hogy miről beszél. Megkérem önöket szépen, hogy hagyják el az intézményt. Jó, figyeljen, elmondtam már négy éve, nyolc éve, elmondtam a zöld szakósnak, elmondtam a piros szakósnak, azt most elmondom a kék szakósnak is. Nem vagyok eladó. Figyelj, nem fogod ezt írni, el kéne menned innen. El kéne mennem, de minden, minden hely foglal. Kívül a Bartonnek, hogy van egy állásom. Jó, fölírjuk a Bartonnek, van egy állásom, halló. Ó, nincs meg a száma. De ide a felekkel is azt hiszem, hogy hívjuk. Úristen, légy fél nyomásod! Mert visszatartom! Ennyire hülye vagy, hogy nem ismered ki ezt a nagyon fontos stratégiai pillanatot, hogy nem beszélgetünk az ellenséggel! Így hívány akar minket, nem akar minket szüntetni, de ennyire hülye vagy, hogy nem fogod fel, hogy háború van, érted? Háború van! hogy felmérjük az állapotát. Szabad? Persze, természetes. Jó. Egy kérdés. Melyik városban vagyunk most? De hogy ne, segítek, azt mondjuk, hogy Buda? Pest. Bravo, bravo, na vissza, sikerült a teszt. Ön egészséges utács. Gratulálok. Ide figyeljétek. Mindegyikőtöknek sikerült a teszt. Egészségesek vagytok, úgyhogy fogjátok magatokat szépen, pakoljatok össze, és menjetek haza. Bezárják ezt az épületet. Nem maradhattok itt tovább, jó? Tehát mindenki menjen innen el. Rendben. Before we came to Silverwood, um, I was actually very excited about seeing an assisted living place because Singapore does not have this concept at all. And as we entered, you know, the first thing we saw was a snack shop. Quite, in fact, very unusual. だけど、おばあちゃんとか年寄りとかと仲良くとか話し合えるのがまあ俺はいいし、あのおじいちゃんとかおばあちゃん、うんなんだろう長年っていうかなんだろう。
まあいろいろ知ってるっていうかそのなんだろう勉強になることを教えてくれる昔のこととか、まあ、そういう楽しい過去のストーリーとかを教えてくれるのが楽しい。My first impression of the place, wow, it's really like a home. It's not like a hospital or a nursing home. You have the kitchen area, you have you know, a living area, you have a dining area, you have you know, cozy lounges. That really made me feel comfortable. I mean, if there was such a home in Singapore, I wouldn't mind being in it. ま、ね、ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんまに。ほんま
Hi, everyone. Tonight is the second night of Art as Res Publici, Art as Public Interests. We will be using art together to engage in public discourse. Last night, we explored the complexities of pluralism in the reading of wills and successions. Two sisters grappling with whose responsibility is it to take care of their aged elderly father. What happens when your personal choices affect the people around you? And is our society welcoming of people who make different choices of the majority? Tonight, we invite you to think about the future of care in aging. What does that mean for Singapore as an aging society? And in the two videos that you watched just now, how did dementia by Proton Theatre make you feel? How does the depiction of art help you to deepen your understanding of what are the challenges that the elderly face and the challenges that the caregivers face? And in the second video made by the Lian Foundation, how do we imagine what are the different models of care that could exist and how does that inform the way we think about care in Singapore? Tonight, we have six commentators who will be helping you to understand the perspectives and needs of the elderly, as well as the challenges of the people providing this care. First up, we have Ms. Radha Basu, Director of Research and Advocacy at the Lian Foundation. She will speak about meaningful elder care models in Japan, the world's oldest country, and how that will change the way Singapore thinks about our philosophy of care. Thank you, Shihui, and a very good evening to all of you. Uh, I'm Radha, and uh, I'm from the Lian Foundation, and uh, I hope you all had a look and enjoy the little clip we showed uh, right now. Tomorrow, we're going to launch this 10-part series on what aging Singapore can learn from Japan, and this was just a sneak preview, so a very big thank you to the organizers for allowing us to do so. Uh, just uh, we Last year, our foundation did a fair bit of uh, advocacy on the need for better residential care in Singapore, and uh, this year, we thought that we would turn our eyes outwards and see what we can learn, both in terms of successes and mistakes from other countries. And we thought we'd start with Japan, because Japan today is pretty much like what Singapore will be in 15 years' time. But first of all, before I talk more about Genki Kaki, I wanted to just kick off the evening by just uh, some boring facts, figures, and numbers, which, uh, which if you are, don't follow aging, you'll be quite startled by. Okay, so Singapore is one of the fastest aging countries in the world right now, and the numbers of elderly in our midst is going to double over the next 15 years. Just to give you a sense of how fast we're aging, these, these figures uh, are uh, from actually our own population.sg website, which is a Government of Singapore initiative. And if you look at how long it took, it took Singapore only 19 years to go from aging to aged. And it took South Korea around the same time, it took Japan 26 years, and it took some European nations more than 115 years to reach this. So we're really aging very fast, faster than most other countries. And if you look at UN projections, do some crystal ball gazing, by 2065, Singapore might overtake Japan to become the oldest country in the world. Of course, one of the big reasons here is that we have uh, a pretty low, we've had consistently low fertility rates for a long time. What people don't realize is that because of the very successful stop at two policy, our fertility rates plummeted from more than four kids during independence to less than two in 1976. So the baby boomers of today only have one or two children, whereas the generation which needs care currently, their parents all had four or five children who can look after them right now. So pretty soon we are going to have a situation where uh, families will, will, will need more help. 
The biggest group is the people who's, who are going to live alone, who will probably need residential care. As you can see, the numbers are going to really shoot up pretty soon. Uh, right now, we have a fair bit, we have a lack of choice in alternatives to nursing homes for people who, who would need care, you know, who cannot be cared for at homes. Uh, last year, as I said, we did a fair bit of advocacy. If, you, if you're interested in finding out more, you can just go to the website here. Just to show you what the insides of a nursing home looks like, that's the old model. It's a picture taken last year where uh, people live for, you know, uh, five, ten years in this dorm-style style, um, um, accommodation with... Uh, 30 people to one room. On the right, you have the newer homes, which have about six to eight people uh, in, in one room. Uh, and although national data is not available, uh, last year when we were looking at how long people stay just anecdotally, we found someone who'd been staying in a nursing home like this for 27 years and still living there. Whereas... Uh, okay. Okay, this, uh, Japan, uh, so, so I, uh, okay, in, in the interest of time, let me just go uh, quickly into our Genki Kaki project. Um, this is a website, as I said, we took three Singaporean seniors to, uh, to Japan to take a look at the wide variety of services there. We are launching this website tomorrow. It's called genkikaki.com. So, and, and we will be progressively uploading articles and films on, on other models of care, not just residential care, but also daycare and care in the community. So keep an eye out for it. So these are some of the, uh, you know, some pictures from there, from, from Japan. Oopsie. Oops. Okay. And that's all I have for now. If you all have questions later in the evening, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Radha. And our second speaker is Dr. <coughs> Philip Yap. Dr. Philip is the director of the Geriatric Center of Kutekpat Hospital, and he will share his insights on how to better understand and care for frail older people with dementia. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I practice geriatric medicine in Kutekpat Hospital, and for the past 15 years, I have been uh, particularly focused on, in, on caring for people with dementia and their families. So I'm going to share my personal thoughts uh, about this issue of dementia and aging in Singapore. Uh, okay, I think I have to shift. <laughs> okay. When I watched uh, the short play, uh, Dementia, the, I recall actually the words of Professor Tom Kidwood, who is uh, said to be the father of person-centered dementia care. And 20 years back, he said this, the story of person with dementia is much more than can be explained by what is going on in the brain. It's a, tragic, it's a story of a tragic inadequacy in our culture, our economy, our traditional views about gender, medical system, and our general way of life. And why did he say that? First, we have to understand uh, the person with the disease dementia. So look at this lady, she may be 80 years old, suffering from dementia. Uh, she lived in a particular time and place in, in history with the attendant cultures and practices of the day. Uh, food is very much associated with a person's identity. Uh, there were also the trends and fashions of the day. For example, we don't take uh, photographs like this anymore. But with aging and with dementia, these very important facets that make up her life and her personhood are slowly eroded because of her disease and her, maybe her physical frailty. She's not able to access the things that actually mean much to her. And also with the ravages of disease, in time, in, in, with time you can see that the person seems to disappear and what's left is a shadow of what this person used to be. Now, we know that the, about the losses of brain cells and intellectual function and dementia and res, the resultant loss of abilities, attributes and function. Um, you may be familiar with the words of Descartes, I think and therefore I am. So for a person who loses his intellectual abilities when he can no longer think, does he cease to be a person? 
There's also this other aspect of loss in dementia. Apart from the loss of brain cells and function, there's also the loss of control, freedom, relationships, uh, familiar routine, dignity, purposeful and meaningful things in life, and his identity. This is often not talked about. But this forms a very important part of the person, his personhood, because by the relational uh, view of, the, of, of personhood, it says that it's the sum total of an individual and his lifelong interaction with the family, the society, and the world at large. So by this um, understanding of personhood, I wish I have a point, actually have a pointer. What you see in a person with dementia is not just the result of brain damage or neurological impairment. It's also the result of uh, changes in his health. It's also dependent on his past, his biography, his basic personality, and also the environment to which he is exposed. As you saw just now, the personhood comprises his interaction with the environment around him. So if we want to make a difference to his life, we can make a difference in the way we continue to interact with him. So how do we then begin to see the person behind the disease dementia? And first is to change or to have a different understanding or notion about dementia. And this is one, that people with dementia are normal people. Are we prepared to say that? Dementia is but a small part of their life. If this lady with, with dementia is 80 years old and she's had dementia only for five years, Five years of dementia out of 80 years, isn't that a very small part of her life? And to be able to care well and attend to them, we need to be able to uphold their personhood and dignity. We need to attend to their basic human needs. These are needs that we all have. The need for comfort, the pet sense of ourselves, our identity, meaningful and purposeful occupation, inclusion, Attachment needs are particularly strong when people are frail and weak, and the opportunity not only to receive love, but to give ourselves to others. This is part and parcel of being human. To frail older people with dementia have the opportunity to meet these needs. So this issue was looked into by Tina McLean. She was an, uh, 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 an anthropologist who actually did two-year ethnographic study on the nursing home care in the US. She immersed herself in the nursing home environment, and she found basically there are two approaches to care. The task-oriented medical one that focused on disease and ignored personal needs. These people were heavily medicated and failed to thrive. But the other one that focused on human needs, uh, focusing on communication, these people uh, had a better quality of life and actually lived even longer. So uh, she says that her findings address issues that medicine cannot answer. They are valuable not only for improving the general quality of life for elders, but also for long-term outcome based on how they are treated and cared for. They need attention, time, and a lot of caring interaction. And there is still hope in cases that many think are lost. So finally, to it's highly important then we provide a supportive environment for people with dementia. If dementia is represented by that broken leg, a poor environment, poor care will, will uh, burden them with excess disability. It will make them worse than what they're supposed to be with the disease. But good care is like giving this man a pair of crutches that he can continue to walk on, to journey on in life despite his dementia. And so, uh, with Lien Foundation, with a Agency for Inter Integrated Care, as well as Ministry of Health, we are trying to build a dementia-friendly society in Singapore. And finally, uh, if I may just last leave you with this last thought, what do we gain, people who don't have dementia, what do we gain by caring well for them? This is one perspective from uh, Francis Kakugawa. She's a caregiver to her father with dementia. She says, when I walk into the adult care centre and see men and women with dementia looking at nothing from where I stand, I can't help but wonder if there's a loving God. If there is, why hasn't he taken all these people home instead of letting them live this way? Then another part of me says, maybe they are here for a purpose, to help us, their caregivers, discover what compassion and love are all about. Maybe after he's true with us, he will take them all home. I still recall Missioner's line in his last novel, Sentinel, that if you want to know or you want to see what love is all about, observe a caregiver with an Alzheimer's patient. Maybe I have not reached that depth of pure love yet. So caring for people with dementia can help us love better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yap. Our third speaker is Ms. Anita Kapoor, TV host and caregiver. She'll be sharing on her experiences staying for two weeks in a nursing home as part of a social documentary made by the Lien Foundation. 
Thank you. I just want to acknowledge that Elizabeth, Jelly, and TK, who you saw in Genki Kaki, are actually here with us in the audience tonight. And where are you? I just want to say hi to you. There they are, right there. Okay, so my five minutes starts after that, okay? <laughs> Thank you. All right, last year in October, I dropped my screen life as a travel television host for a subject matter very close to my heart and which I'm a fierce advocate of, elder care. I checked into an elder care home as a resident for two weeks to help create a social documentary with the Lien Foundation, which you saw up on the board earlier. As a daughter and a caregiver to my late mom over a decade and who passed away in May this year, I have become intimately and acutely associated with a healthcare care system designed around ticking the box curing as a system of gentle and effective prevention and holistic long-term benefit. Frankly, I have rarely experienced the extension of care within health or the hope post-health. The current system and our response is largely one of absolutes and stereotypes, strict categories, into which many, like my mother, did not fit. And when you don't fit a system designed for absolutes despite geriatric care being a constellation of varied needs, you fall through the cracks quickly, unless the elder person or family are as relentlessly diligent to disallow the system to prevail. I'd like to, however, also say that even when an elder does fit into the system, they also lose because the parameters are rigid, disallowing of change, and unable to cope and respond with situations outside the proverbial box. Over the decade, I have experienced a healthcare and care mindset in entrenched in rote. There is a struggle of frustration and a suppression. The holistic is minimal, and if present, it is not practiced in a widespread manner, often only a pilot project, um, limited availability, expensive, or, or some type of risk-averse extremism. When I entered Peace Haven to experience life as an elder in care that is not home-based, I expected to understand quite fluently this boxing, resistance, and denial of needs, which I've encountered in hospitals, rehab centers, clinics, and more, since most elder care homes follow the exact same blueprint, from ratios of staff to patients to how many beds, to hardware to cost per head to approaches to therapy and healing. I was ready for this. But quite frankly, within three days of my two-week stay and for months after my stay, I was shell-shocked at the deep disrespect and dismissal of the elderly as people which the system operates on. To be an elder in need of care in Singapore is one of two things. Home care and family protection, sometimes overprotection or none at all, with support services and silver directories that are both hard to navigate and frankly basic. Or a home where protection is a gamble, family more often than not distant, occasional or non-existent, and environment dismal. And the stay is usually till death. There is far too much to speak of that I witness and experience in just five minutes. I'll ask you to only think of these things. Why as a country and a people and a system are we in denial and discomfort of aging, and especially of positive, empowered aging? Why does aging elicit a desire to suppress the aging person into an acceptable aged KPI of existence? Why are we locked into the denial of needs of older people beyond the basics, roof, medicines, three meals, someone to watch over them? Why have we given up or tabooed on their humanness, their emotional, environmental, mental, and sexual needs, their need for motivation, support, and happiness? Why are we entrenched in a system between dependency and despair, where all elders were once empowered, lived resilient, active lives, and why does the healthcare system systematically whittle the elderly and the elderly sick into a model of reductive sustainability, denying the elder accessibility and often also their family, choice, forward-thinking care, and ease of availability. Why is aging and aged care such a controversy? Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Our fourth speaker is Ms. Angela Leong, cultural medallion winner, prolific dance maker. She will share with us how her curriculum for dance movement is being used by healthcare professionals as an intervention for dementia. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share with you all the slides first, just in case I got the beep off from upstairs, okay? <laughs> yeah, just to, there we go, eh? Yes, uh, yes. I'm gonna talk about one thing that is very close to my practice, since my work involves movement, and so I'm gonna talk to you about space, the sense of space. So then here, three things. One, personal space versus general space, and um, the need to respect privacy, and here, uh, next, yeah. okay, can I freeze the time? Yes. Uh, help. Ah, 
okay, yes. So next, we talk about familiar space or immediate space around us. That, uh, how do we do that? So uh, again, uh, I, I will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, as, as we turn everyday activities into kinesthetic experience, so these experiences are meaningful and it's fun. And it's not just about like wiping the table, washing the dishes. Okay, last one. <sighs> Sorry about this. I'm really, really uh, technically impaired. Okay. Uh. <laughs> last one. Yes, there we go. Last one, a safe space for social interaction. And I don't mean safe space as in the theater liability proof. No, what I mean is a sp safe space that we need to, we need to establish uh, so that a certain kind of genuine connection can be found. And uh, again, we use movement, creative movement, to synergize, engage, and, con and connect. OK, great. Now, <laughs> ah, first, I think um, when I mention space, personal space versus general space, in dance training and discipline, and uh, the dance discipline, we talk about general personal space, which is really, really an in, um, uh, individual, uh, well, we can use a big word, kinesphere reach. You reach front, backside, you know, all this, this is your immediate personal space. And of course, um, a, a, a general space is where you unleash your body and fly and travel into space, and that's how it is. Um, but again, I think uh, more than eight years ago, I started working with, um, in specific, a group of frail and advanced age elderly, and with the help of my dancers. And so I developed a curriculum that is skimmed from everyday actions, everyday routines, but process them into something meaningful movement, into a little dance that anybody can just pick it up like this. And I call this curriculum um, based on creative movement, um, everyday waltzes for active aging. So from there, as we took, as we continue, and this is still an evolving curriculum. As I took the curriculum to different uh, rehab center, senior rehab center, and uh, uh, nursing homes, I noticed that the sense of personal space versus general space becomes very prominent. And of course, because I'm a mover, so again, the minute I walk into a room, the space kind of like speaks to me. And, and that is very immediately, this is how I learn and gather information. Personal space, I think it's the first thing as quote unquote, a sick person or unwell persons concede because immediately you're being thrown into a general space or a highly organized space whereby um, everybody else around is using that space. You take a shower, there's no privacy. You might need help. Uh, maybe, I think um, I have also visited some senior housing, and this is a double sharing unit, only two beds. But again, the arrangement of the beds and all the furnishing are so open that it, it doesn't leave any discrete personal space for, for individual coverage. Uh, so in that sense, I think it also resulted in a lot of animosity between the roommates. And after all, they are adult individuals. So again, coming back to here, personal space, in, in a way, I do think it is so important that we, again, uh, it's not just we, I'm sure we all agree, but on the, on the other hand, again, with the, the, the healthcare organizations, they have to recognize and respect that sense of privacy. And as we see that, the sense and respect of privacy helps, especially a person with diminishing cognitive and communicative ability, capabilities, to, to kind of, in a sense, to, to kind of uh, delay their, their withdrawal, their social withdrawal, so that it will not affect their sense of place, sense of selves, and sense of belonging. So uh, I have to stop here again. Um, I, I think I will just stop, uh, stop at the point that whereby we can think about just one thing, space around us. You have your own room, your own bed. What happens if all of these are taken away? And you're gonna not just camping, but you have to share with the whole world, so to speak. And anybody can barge in any time. How would that affect this person? So let's just think about that. Thank you very much.
So as our fifth speaker, Dr. Vivian Wee prepares to take her space. Um, Dr. Vivian Wee is a founder member of AWARE, and tonight she will speak on how women are carrying the responsibilities of caregiving and what are the resulting consequences of that. Hello, I'm Vivian Wee from AWARE. Um, last year, 680,000 women were outside the labour force. This even increased a little uh, since 2015, when 670,000 women were outside the labour force. These are government statistics from the Singapore Labour Force Survey. Now, persons outside the labour force are not considered as unemployed because they are not regarded as looking for a job. The total number of residents in Singapore who are outside the labour force is slightly more than 1 million, 1.06 million. And of these 1.06 million, 64% are women, numbering this 680,000. While there are only 380,000 men, comprising 36%, who are outside the labour force. Why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because 39% of these 680,000 women said that family responsibilities are the reason why they left the labour force. Now, what was really striking to us in the way is that even younger women, aged 25 to 40, also gave this reason. The majority of women are giving this kind of reason. Now, if you want to compare men and women, only 2.4% of the 380,000 men who are outside the labour force gave that reason. Okay, this shows very clearly that caregiving is a women's job. There is a gender division of labour. And women are the ones who are taking up the responsibility of caregiving to the extent of dropping out of the labour force. Sometimes we hear that, oh, education will change it. It's not true, because we are also getting better educated women who are also dropping out of the labour force. What needs to change is the way we care for people. The labour force survey acknowledges that women are more likely to leave the labour force when they are younger and not because they retire. And the first national survey of caregivers, taking of, uh, of caregivers who are taking care of individuals aged 70 and above, show that 60% are female. So that's what I want to talk about, women as caregivers. Now, very often we hear in Singapore that elderly persons are assessed medically about whether they are competent in activities of daily living. This is shortened to ADL. Okay, can they feed themselves? Can they dress themselves? Can they comb their own hair? This sort of thing. Okay, so there are about six uh, ADLs and they are assessed on that. But in Singapore, we never, never assess instrumental activities of daily living. Sure, the elderly person can feed herself, but who cooked her food? Who went to the market? She can dress herself up, who washed her clothes? That's what we ignore. So these caregivers are performing the IADL, which are ignored. Okay, this is why they end up leaving the labor force. Okay. So this is 39% of 680,000 women, and, then, and they number quite um, a lot, you know, they are about 265,200 women. 265, that's somewhat more than a quarter of a million uh, people. They become caregivers. So what happens to them? First, they become financially dependent. They depend on their spouses, they depend on other family members, then you hope their children do well and can support them. And then the family becomes financially very stressed because the people who are earning the money have to care for the elderly person and they have to support the caregivers. Of course, the caregivers themselves are physically and emotionally stressed, as uh, my colleagues on the panel have just said. You know. And then 
this is the part we are also concerned about. When these women themselves age and become elderly, who looks after them? Because they have become financially dependent for most of their lives. They don't have enough savings for their old age. And they may lack the care that they need at that time. And as uh, Radha has said, families are growing smaller. So who are the children who are going to look after the women who were caregivers? So like Dolene, who was uh, mentioned in your booklet about this festival, Dolene who wants her voice back, I think these women want their lives back. So um, Rana has helpfully shown that in 15 years' time, the number of Singaporeans aged 65 and above will be almost a million. Okay, that means one in four Singaporeans will be in the age group, up from one in eight today. So of the four Singaporeans, one will be over 65, and then who will be the other three? So this is why we think it's time that the women who are caregivers are acknowledged and are not treated as invisible, and we need the collective will to do so. Thank you, Dr. Wee. Our last speaker is Dr. Jeremy Lim, partner in Oliver Wyman Singapore. He will be speaking on the economics of care, drawn from his extensive experience in surgery, public health, and academia. A, a very good evening to everyone. Actually, I won't be speaking about that. I was, it's always nice to go last because you can listen to everyone else and then figure out what you want to say. <laughs> but before I shoot my mouth off, uh, are there any civil servants in the audience? <laughs> okay, then I'll shoot my mouth off. Okay. Um, perhaps let me, let me close off the entire discussion with two somewhat awkward truths and, and, and one heartfelt appeal to all of you. Um, and let me start with the awkward truths. The first awkward truth is that in Singapore, we don't like to say so, but we are deeply utilitarian. The greatest good for the greatest number. And once you're no longer economically terribly productive, useful, the interest in you from society, from the, from the, from the, from the government dramatically declines. And hence, vulnerable populations, seniors, those with dementia, are then left out in the lurch. I remember, uh, and I wouldn't call myself a dissident, at least not the Lee Sien Yang type of dissident, <laughs> okay, but one of the first articles that I wrote for the, for the Straits Times, I think rather I was still with the Straits Times then, see, so we end this together, was, was about why Singapore's MediShield should cover children born with congenital illnesses. Right, uh, and believe it or not, once upon a time, children born with hole in the heart, cleft palates, and so on weren't. And the response from the government was that it was not cost effective to keep premiums low for everybody else. We had to take this group and treat them separately, meaning the greatest good for the greatest number. And that still, in my mind, deeply permeates Singapore policy making. And that's one awkward truth, starting to soften, but not enough. The second awkward truth is that aging care for patients with dementia, vulnerable populations, is not an existential issue. Singapore is very, very good at addressing existential issues. Water is existential, so we have solved it. Doesn't matter whether it's a million dollar problem or a billion dollar problem, it's existential, we will solve it. When I was serving national service as a medical officer, we spent six months advocating and preparing the ground for a, for, a, for a certain piece of technology that was about $3 million that would improve the safety of soldiers. At the end, after we presented this at the meeting, one of the senior um, uh, military officers, who shall remain nameless, said, Jeremy, why did you all go through all this work? It's only $3 million. When we fire a missile, it's much, much more than that. And we miss half the time anyway. Right? So once it's existential, we will solve the problem. And the appeal to all of you is that arts form such a powerful medium to convey the 
to convey the importance, the existentialness of, of really some of these issues. Let me end off with one quick anecdote because I do sit on the governing council of the, of the, of the Dover Park Hospice and it's so striking how, how much political and how much policy support we get when a, when a senior politician, when a, when a senior civil servant is personally affected. And that we wouldn't wish that upon everyone, but I think through arts, through the, through the creative forces, we can make this experience real for every single one of us and shift care for seniors, care for patients with, with dementia into the same realm as water, as really defense and make it existential. Thank you very much. Given that the topic of care is relevant to everyone, whether in your personal capacities in families or whether in your capacity as a citizen, as we come together to debate what is the standard of care we are offering to people in Singapore and very soon ourselves, um, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, I'd like to invite our commentators on stage, please, as our discussants begin to think about what they would like to ask and follow up on. 34. Should we move up there? Yes, please. So I just shoot the question while. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Jeremy just mentioned about the Smedi Shield. I'm just wondering if uh, you could comment or does anyone else comment about where the CPF fails and where it succeeds? That would help. Number six. Hi, um, this is, uh, I, I guess, a question for all of the panelists. I'm wondering what your opinion would be on this. My perception, at least in my family and the people around me, is that one of the big difficulties in dealing with aging is that there's a profound fear of aging and of death. Um, not that everyone doesn't have that, but in a society where we're so driven to be excellent, to be achieving, any moment in which you start to fall short of that and to become dependent on others is something that's considered shameful. And aging is, some, is a stage that we will all, a stage in which we will all come to that. What would you think is the best way to start to address this fear Perhaps we could take one more question before we get the commentators to answer. Hi, uh, if you don't mind, can I try to represent the status quo? So imagine if I'm the government, if I'm the current uh, group of caregivers or the nursing home, etc. Um, and I'm sure all of us, right, the status quo, right, would have 1,001 reason why uh, change is hard. So from what I gather so far, the, the main gist of the, your, the message is that something needs to change, right? Either you need to be more uh, personal or give more privacy to the elderly, et cetera, et cetera. So out of all this 1,001 reason, right, could you think of one reason where you think that they completely got it wrong, i.e. the reason that they have is, is, is not valid, okay? And think of one reason where you think that actually there's some truth in it, and then a follow-up question to that is how might we actually then overcome that challenge? Does that make sense? The okay. commentators. Uh, let me take the easy question on CPF, then I'll hand over to the others. Uh -huh. okay. Uh, okay, we can blame the PAP government for many things, but you can't blame the government for, for actually CPF. That was a British legacy. And I think CPF pretty much has proven quite effective for really old age planning and for really financial adequacy. Where it's starting to totter is that we have bundled everything else onto CPF, housing, boosting the stock market, etc., etc. And unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, we are living so damn long right, that CPF doesn't quite cover it. And the issues are going to get worse with this so-called sharing economy, contract workers. I Personally, I don't think CPF is is fit for our purpose anymore. But I don't think this is, a, this is a deviant or a dissident view, and the government's worrying about this, but it's unclear what the solution can or should be. And now that I've taken the easy one, can I hand over to someone for the difficult questions? 
Ah, good, good. No, I, I also want to uh, follow you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about CPF from the point of view of the caregivers. They've left the workforce, they have no income. So then the government started this initiative of asking the spouses who are earning money to transfer money. And in parliament, the question was raised, is this just going to be voluntary? And the minister, I think was one of the up and coming ministers, who said, no, 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 we must let the citizen take responsibility voluntarily. So the um, amount that has transferred over is minuscule. Now, actually, all this care of uh, the elderly, it depends on the work, how well off the family is. Of course, rich family can hire nurses, domestic workers, you know, have the nursing home inside their house, whatever. We're talking about the poor families. I mean, even to hire a foreign domestic worker is not so easy. You've got to have either two years of income tax paid you know, faithfully, or you have uh, 50,000 locked up in a fixed deposit. Not everybody can have a foreign domestic worker. You have to be given permission to have a foreign domestic worker. So there, is, there are only 200,000 over for foreign domestic workers. So even if every elderly person had a foreign domestic worker, that's not enough because we have about 680,000 elderly persons over 65. Sorry, I would like to uh, encourage the panel to answer a difficult question. Sure, I'll give it a shot. I'm going to answer your question and your question, which I understood as how do we get past that feeling of it being shameful? And I think your question was give us an example of where it, it had The reasons failed. are valid and where the reasons are not valid for having change to occur in our healthcare system. Okay, so I'll look at it like this. I think it is remarkable that we actually make any policy without making it somehow personal how we make any decisions in life about aging and healthcare and so on without realizing that we're actually gonna be one of those people at some point in time. So I think if we continue to make policies that are so detached from the actual humanity of the situation, we're gonna keep going into these cycles over and over again. And I would say I would use the same thing for family as well. I think empathy, compassion, and all of those things come into play when you actually put yourself into the same situation. I mean, when I checked into the elder care, because a lot of people were like, yeah, you know, you put yourself into the, actually I didn't. I just went in there with a complete open mind and heart to think, how would it be if right now I were to be in this system? Not how would I be when I'm 70? How do I feel right now? And that is what actually empowers me and enlightens me and you know puts the fire in me because I think, well, if I don't actually change the system for them now, there's not gonna be any change for anything in the future either. So I think fear is there and it's prevalent, fear of death and, and all of those things. Um, but I think I'm actually more fearful of not having been part of changing a system. Um, and I think the same goes for what you've said. You know, I think the, the less that we fear changing the system, the more we can actually do something about it. Uh, put yourself in that system. Don't put elderly, and it's always like this, is partitioning off of the, the, the elderly. We are all the elderly as much as we are all the young and we are all the middle aged you know because it allows us to have much broader policies and policies that actually then take into consideration respect and autonomy and independence and space and all of those things so i hope that answers i gave it my best shot thank you dr philip can i request that you take one of the difficult questions which is to offer up a reason why change might be hard in the healthcare system and to think about how we can collectively solve that? Yeah, actually, um, just riding on what uh, Jeremy and uh, Anita have said, I think we all know that um, aging, long-term care, and, and eventually death, these are re really ex existential issues. And we will all uh, one day become old, and some of us will get dementia. Many of us will end up in nursing homes, given the way society is going to evolve with time. And um, so the issue is, What's our image of, of long-term care and dementia now? We have many negative stereotypes attached to dementia and long-term care today. Um, if we continue to, to hold on to these stereotypes, then we will all be afraid to grow old, to get dementia and to die. But can, can we then change the, the image of, of long-term care, of, of dementia? So the, the, the impetus to change is now. We're changing it also for ourselves so that when we reach that stage, we will not be so afraid to die because we, will, we, we begin to see that there are still possibilities, that it can still be a positive thing, that people with dementia uh, in long-term care can still thrive and live out their, old, their, their last days uh, with dignity. 
And if people, we see people dying well, for example, we may not be, then be so afraid to, to die because we see a, a more positive image of, of dying. And um, so, but this involves a huge mindset shift and, and a culture change. It's a very, very in-depth kind of change. And I think the reason why people are not able to change is because we have just become too comfortable with the status quo. And also because they do not, or many of us may not see the possibility. So I think uh, Lian Foundation making a trip to Japan to see that older people in long-term care can actually live well and thrive, I think it's a positive thing because we must be able to see uh, what is possible before we, we, we feel the impetus to actually want to change. I'm um, sorry, yep. sorry Angela, can I? Um, I see that the discussions are burning to ask many questions. So maybe 40, 21, and then 36. Hi, um, thank you for sharing so much with us. Uh, this question is actually specifically for Dr. Philip. Um, it looks like nowadays when my friends and I meet, we only talk about, are your parents having dementia? And it's mainly something that we talk about because our parents are at that age, but we're not really sure what dementia is. And everything is anecdotal. Like for instance, oh, you know, uh, he went up to a table in a restaurant and said, that food looks good, dig her finger inside and tasted it. And of course, the children were horrified, you know, so is that dementia? Or another story of how um, the parent became, the father became paranoid that the sisters were stealing from him and entrusted all the monies with a distant relative. Is that dementia? When do we know the onset of dementia? And, and when does it become really serious? Uh, I think a lot of us don't quite know, and it's probably at the onset that it can cause the most misunderstanding and, and, and uh, problems in the family itself. Because um, there's another situation where a parent, uh, a, a parent told one sibling that another sibling is stealing his pen and, and what, whatever. So, you know, it caused a lot of friction among the siblings uh, before they could finally figure out that he did not have such a pen. It was a pen he had a long time ago. So, but in the meantime, nobody knew there was dementia taking roots because there's no clear indication that it's dementia taking place. So that's the first thing. And the second thing now is that there's so little literature about when someone is um, physically uh, incapable and they have dementia, the treatment is even going to be worse. Like for instance, my mom now, as uh, my, my sister, as Dr. Vivian Wee has pointed out, is usually the homemaker. My, my, my sister happens to be a housewife, so she was able to look after my mom. But now she has stopped wanting to eat food. You know, like a baby, she just shuts her mouth when you try to feed her. So that's causing us a lot of consternation because we don't really want her to starve to death. But my sister just WhatsApp around uh, from the net uh, literature that says actually it's part of dementia that they stop eating, you don't have to worry, da 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 da. But we are not sure what's happening. There's so little, little information and literature about it. And so that's the second point. The third point is this. Sorry, could I invite you to allow some of the Sorry, other okay, discussions? Just this one last one. Looking at all these things, my friends and I and my siblings said, oh, we don't really want to reach that stage. Can we kill ourselves before we reach that stage because the quality of life is not there? Is there space for euthanasia, mm. right? I'm sorry, it's going to be very controversial, but we look at it and we say we don't want to be there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time and because we want to hear from as many of you as possible, could I request that you keep your comments short? Okay, um, my, my question is quite short. Anyone? So this question is uh, for Dr. Wee. In your, in your speech just now, you mentioned that you think that these female caregivers should be acknowledged. What do you mean by that and what do you have in, in mind? Done. Thank you. Um, 36 next. Uh, so I wrote this down, be it young or old, the issue to me is as an aging nation and low birth rates is about the lack of empathy and intimacy. And it cannot always just be about currency and utilitarianism of the citizen as it has been for the first 51 years. So how can we as artists and the man on the street encourage intimacy and uh, empathy in a way that's sustainable and far-reaching beyond this room and out there to people that actually are affected by this on a day-to-day -day basis? 
Thank you. Could I invite number eight to ask your question, please? Thanks. Um, it's not a question, um, but I realize because I am a caregiver, my parents don't have dementia, but they live with me. I've got three other siblings. I realize that my concept of aging for my parents differ from their concept of aging, and it differs from my three other siblings, what aging should mean. And it's, it's resulted in a lot of conflict. I'm not sure if anyone can throw some light on that. The other thing is, I've got friends, like um, one of the discussions mentioned, whose mother has dementia. And in, in sharing her, her concerns with us, it became very clear that some of us know more about the options out there than others. And this information is not accessible to all, not really. And so we watch our friends and their families make decisions that are not necessarily very good for the, her, her mom. It's very painful to be in this environment where these things are tossed up. So it's not a question, but I wonder if anyone can surface some insights. Thank you. And number 25, last of all, before we turn it back to the commentators again. Remember the question? <laughs> I will remind you. Hi, hi. This is, this is a different question from what people have asked. Um, I'm just actually wondering, I mean, is there a role that technology can play in helping this issue? You know, there's a lot of talk about us being a smart nation and relying on robots and, you know, I don't know, sort of um, machines and things like that. Can that, based on your individual experience, both clinical and, you know, just based on caregiving, can that play a role? I mean, 30 years down the road, do you think that might help the issue in some way? I'd like to hear a bit more about that. Thanks. So I think there's a common thread here because some of the discussants have mentioned multiple times that people don't know what dementia is. And because of that, the caregivers don't know how to react. And after that, when the caregivers do know how to take care of the elderly parents, how do we then fairly acknowledge their efforts? So if the panel could shed some light on this. Okay, yeah, I think it's a medical kind of question, so I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the, we all know that uh, the, one of the cardinal, cardinal symptoms of dementia is forgetfulness. So forgetfulness is one of the most common presentations of, of dementia. It's usually short-term memory that's affected first. Long-term memory re remains relatively intact until uh, beyond the middle stage of the disease. So they may remember what happened 30 or 40 years ago with much clarity, maybe even better than uh, us. But um, what happens is maybe one hour ago or what happened yesterday, they may have a very vague idea. Idea. So I think forgetfulness is one of the cardinal symptoms. So because they are forgetful, they tend to uh, repeat themselves often. They ask the same question over and over again. They may have problems with, say, finding their things because they misplace them often. But beyond just forgetfulness, um, People with dementia also have problems with what we uh, say in the medical t uh, literature, uh, executive function. Uh, this refers to a broad range of abilities, including the ability to have goal-directed behavior, to be able to uh, work towards a certain goal, uh, to, to initiate, to, to motivate oneself towards a certain goal, to be able to plan, to organize, to multitask, to, to, to have insight and awareness, to make good decisions. These are all affected in people with dementia. So when, we see, when a person with dementia starts to you know, lose out in life, it's not so much because of the memory, because if I have adequate insight and awareness of my problem, um, I will try to problem solve. Now, if I know my memory is no good, then I will try to compensate by maybe, maybe using a notebook. Um, but if my insight is poor and my, my problem-solving ability is poor, then and I, I, I will not then be so aware of my problem. And so I will not make any effort to compensate for my deficit. So this is what actually uh, causes people with dementia to lose, uh, uh, lose touch in life and to start to lose out in life. So I think this, this is a, a, an important issue to know. Um, I think there was some mention about uh, um, you know, providing adequate or uh, supporting people with dementia adequately and family caregivers having frustration. Uh, I just want to very quickly mention that, uh, like I mentioned in the, in, in, in the talk, while people lose their cognitive abilities, uh, they still retain their ability to have meaningful relationships. And actually, what people with dementia need most 
is relationships. But, but the very nature of the disease is such that it increasingly isolates them from, from other people. They become a bit difficult, they seem to be self-centered. So the very thing they need, actually they, they, they are undermining for themselves. Um, but if we can actually continue to re keep in touch with them and maintain strong relationships with them by attending to their very human needs, the need for a meaningful occupation, for identity, for security, for comfort, then actually like, we can actually sustain the person in them. And with that, actually, um, the face of dementia or the image of dementia can change. And you will see that they, they will not be so difficult anymore if you actually are able to provide them with patient and, and, and unconditional love. I think this is what I have learned in, in the 15 years that I've been involved in dementia care. Caregivers who are able to dedicate a substantial amount of their time um, usually have better outcomes than those who leave the care of their, their parents with dementia uh, to, to, to somebody else, like to a domestic helper. Thank you, Dr. Yap. Um, can I invite Radha and Angela actually to comment on how can we build more en empathy and intimacy in the care for elderly? Because I think in the Lian Foundation video, we saw such very lovely models of care. Uh, but there was one question about euthanasia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we could address that after we talk about... Okay, that is a... Not an easy question. In fact, we went our journey to Japan. What, what, one lesson we, we learned from there is that they have this sense of genki, which is well-being and health, and actually, and, and, and just looking out for each other. I mean, when we were playing the Silverwood video, uh, Philip just commented to me, it's just like a little kampong, because you know, the little boys and uh, girls who visit that, that assisted living facility, um, they actually look out for the seniors. Now, how do we create it? It's really, wow, that's difficult because it's not an easy thing to do. I think, again, it goes back to us being a high-achieving utilitarian society. In Japan, when we went there, there were all these kids who were just hanging around in the afternoon at this old age home. Philip asked me, do they volunteer? No, they don't. They just hang around. Whereas here, our children are going to, you know, are going to tuition classes every day. So I I think we, again, we need to move beyond this utilitarianism, especially because those of us who are aware of what's happening overseas, uh, we know that we are fairly blessed in terms of finances in Singapore. And so maybe we, we don't need to work so hard or study so much. And, and uh, there, there is real, and I, I, I mean that because um, we, we're already doing quite well. So maybe we should focus on, on, on just, just caring for other people, you know, as individuals. It's a hard question. I'm not sure I answered that uh, well, but that's what I think. But before, can I just quickly go back to one question, which I found is like a very good question, and I'm like dying to answer it, which was the first question, which was, what is the one thing we are doing wrong, and what is the one thing we are doing right? And in terms of what we are doing wrong, as a, and by we, I mean, correct me, I think the question was aimed at what is the government or our policymakers doing wrong, right? Um, the question was, was why is change in the healthcare system difficult? Difficult to, uh, or, uh, why is change in the healthcare system difficult to achieve? Okay, uh, one, one thing is, f f as long as we keep repeating this old mantra that family will be the first line of support. You know, that things will be okay. There, there's a, it's a two-pronged mantra. Family will look after you, or we have this huge army of domestic workers that other, pe other countries don't. Now, uh, Vivian and I shared about our fertility rates, and you, you know we are aging very fast, family shrinking very fast, so that might not work in future. The second <coughs> point is about domestic workers. Uh, I think um, they're, not, they're not under our labor laws currently, so um, it's not a very it's not a very, um, well, I, I feel uncomfortable because if you look at the pay and the hours, it's not, as a society, again, it goes back to what is right. And I, I, I just think that um, 
we need to do more, not just for the domestic workers who are looking after our elderly at home, but also care staff in our nursing homes. I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, starting pay for a care staff, a foreign care staff in our homes uh, is around $400 today. So, and they look after like 30 people at night. This, of course, they get free food and free accommodation, but you, if you add it up, it goes, goes up to about $1,000. What we do not realize is that the, the hunt for global caregiver, the hunt for professional caregivers is global. Japan is paying three, four times what we are paying for these, and Australia, Canada, you know, the, all these countries are paying, and, and we just sit back and say, oh, but we will have domestic workers and we will have these caregivers. I don't know how long or how sustainable or how right that is. Okay, and in terms of what we... Uh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. I think Angela would like to weigh in on the issue as well. <laughs> Okay, I, I think I'm going to bring the issue way back, okay? And I think in a very organic way, we are talking what is right, what is wrong. I think it's a matter of value. And so when we say that, that means we don't have the culture, or rather the culture is not consolidated. Uh, if you look at Japan, I've been to Japan for research last year, but not, not for this, uh, not for the elder care, uh, for my own creative research. What struck me is uh, the people there, young or old, especially the old, the generations, they have such deep-seated relationship um, with the environment, with the land, with, with customs, and they manage to keep it. And um, in that sense, I know Singapore is a very young country, and so that fear about getting old uh, is looms, first of all, you know, comes into as a hurdle. And second, and yes, it has something to do with populations. We, we seldom, we don't have, I don't know, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, correct me. We might not live with our grandparents. And I grew up, personally, I grew up in a family, a big family. I have grandparents and great-grandparents even. Um, and I'm very used to having elderly old people around. And, and so, and I remember the first time when I took my dancers out to work in the rehab center, I think uh, one of the young dancers said, she just freaked out and she said, I don't know what to do. And I said, just go say hello. And if you don't know what to do, what to say, just touch the hands and shake the hands. And that's it. So um, I think our young people, uh, again, I don't want to get into this thing about young and old, yeah? Uh, but, it, uh, you know, people are not just, the younger generation are just not um, <coughs> feel comfortable um, to kind of relate to the, the anybody who is like, what, over 40, over 50? Um, and, <laughs> hello, you know, what is old, what is young? And I think by the time we get into 20, 21st century, hello, you know, we, you see, okay, you see big movie stars and big artists and they are, you know, these people are in the 70s, 80s, they're creating and, and that's what it is. They have a focus. You know, coming back to here, so that culture, I think it is important to have the immediate family to provide that immediate support, the personal space, the intimate space. However, on the other hand, I think we need the general space. The government need to walk in, yes. We we do need the state to set up regulation, legislations to take care of, to really, really put in a so-called system. And sometimes system is good. I'm an artist, I would say that sometimes a system is good. Uh, because in that sense it provides a consistent way of doing something. But however, if we have that culture about really, not, not just about like, oh, that's my grandparents, I have to take care of them. But other than that, but uh, you know, other elderly people, I think we also feel that affinity and, and that connections. I do think that probably in certain way, I cannot prove it scientifically, um, it might make things go down a lot easier and straightforward. And maybe in Japan, we, we may learn from there. And it's not just hard existential, uh, hardware, there are some software inside, deep inside our heart, yeah, that we could actually examine. Um, Jeremy and Anita, I have a little very, bit of a challenge quick. for you. Would you take the euthanasia question? Yeah, absolutely. But just one quick thing, because I think there were a couple of very personal uh, questions which I really like the lady in front at eight and the gentleman over there talking about the kind of um, uh, frustration that it causes in a family and I think the problem with all of this is that we're facing uh, our parents changing 
And it's very difficult often for us to accept that change. And we feel embarrassed by things that they might do. I gotta tell you, sometimes when I'm at a buffet, I just wanna put my finger in it and eat it too. And I can't even remember what I had for lunch yesterday. And I'm only 46. So let's, let's be fair, <laughs> all right? Let's be fair. And I think it is a very difficult thing, but I really like what you said. And please, will you be my doctor in the future? Because <laughs> I need you. I need somebody like you who looks at aging as, a, as a, an emotional and a mental and a physical thing. And I think that, that this inability to kind of want to actually help or change yourself is one of the first signs of dementia, actually. My mother didn't have dementia, but she did have um, uh, memory loss and many of the things that seemed like dementia, but they really weren't. But I realized that later on in her life, what was happening was she wasn't able to actually do or had no desire or impetus to do anything to change it, no matter how much I you know, wanted her to. And to the question about having siblings, I have two sisters as well, and I've made all the decisions literally on my own. Um, all the time that I needed to make the decisions for the 10 years of my mom's life that I took care of her. The reason being is that actually we do have a system that is very murky and it's very difficult to navigate. So the person who should make those decisions is the one who is able to stand up to the system and actually navigate it. Because the people who cannot stand up to the system then eventually fall prey to it. And I do believe that the system absolutely is ill in itself and needs to change. And what you were saying as well, we do have need to have much cleverer depth insight, insightful and, imp and, and empowered, compassionate kind of legislation, and it isn't there yet. So yes, we're going to probably have to take it on and really struggle through it, but do it, because the other thing I wanted to point out is that it's a brain switch. You just have to accept them exactly as they are, as they are now. That's it and go with that. I've made decisions and I've had conversations and I've had accepted things with my mom that made absolutely no sense. But in order to feel the compassion and feel for her where she is in this moment, that's the only way to do it. We do it with children. And I think it was you who said two days ago that it is a second childhood, very much dementia. And also just an aging parent, often it's a second childhood. So I think that allows you then to be a little bit more sympathetic and a little bit more patient. Not always, no one's perfect. Um, but in terms of um, euthanasia, which we're gonna move into, absolutely, why not? I mean, why not have the ability to control? You, you try to control your life, why not be able to have, to have the ability to control your death and have the death that you want? Uh, nobody is in charge of your death, only you. And I completely support the, the, the euthanasia. I mean, I would not be able to do it because I am afraid of knives even. I wouldn't be able to do it personally. But to have that option means that you then give the adult the adult opportunity to make the decisions that they want to make. Um, it is not fair that the discussants get to have all the fun, so this is my signal to open the questions to the floor. Uh, could I invite two or three questions at a time and we can get the panel to weigh in? Is there anyone from the floor who would like to ask a question? The gentleman. Um, a mic will, or, or would you like to speak up? Okay, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, the question is, we've been talking a lot about what government can do, but sometimes it just takes the private sector to do something and then the government will just go along with it. So is that something that the private sector could do like immediately because businesses act so much faster? If there's money to be made and people can figure out how to connect the dots, it just keeps going. So any thoughts on that? So thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to offer a question to the panel? I'm um, sorry, the gentleman up there in the last row. Hi, I just want to ask about, um, so there, for many of the younger generation, there's this huge language barrier and, and there was this government's policy against the use of dialects as well and like how the younger generation can adequately understand the needs of our elderly if we can't even communicate with them. Yeah, yeah, like how should we address this problem? So I'm going to allow one question from here, fight for it. Okay, um, 39. You stuck your hand up the highest.
biologically possible. <laughs> um, how gay affirming and queer affirming is healthcare and elder care? And I mean that on every level. I don't want to be in a situation where I end up in institutional care and I have to go back in the closet. Uh, so I also don't want to be in a situation where um, I am in elder care, there is couples housing, and it is only open to opposite sex couples. So what are we doing um, to, acknowledge, to acknowledge and to address that? So on that firecracker of a wait, question. So wait, can I throw in a question that is perhaps taking a bit different tack from what everyone else has been taking? Um, I want to throw in the question that, in a sense, towards more, maybe, to, maybe defending the government here a little bit more. Jeremy talked about existential, uh, existential threats. And I think everything that you say appeals to all of us, appeals to our hearts, but it comes, it comes down, what it comes down to is of course, it will make the healthcare system far more costly. It will make elder care far more costly. And that's where I'm talking about Jeremy's point because that's where you run up against one of the existential threats that the government sees, which is where does the money come from? The whole point about saying family first is because the government's hoping that, you know, the working, the, the, the working economic units can help bear the cost directly up front. Of course, for you to say that we're all doing well, Singapore isn't always doing well. As uh, Dr. Wee pointed out, there are lots of very poor people out there who can't actually afford to, to, to take care of the elderly. And you know, they're str financially struggling. So then it becomes a question for the government. And then you know, if the cost falls to the government, you run up against, like I said, the existential threat, which is the government thinking, right now we have the money, but what happens, will the money run out at any point? And how do we, uh, how, how do we, how do we assure the government of that? Do we, can we assure the government of that, that the money can always be there? How do we fight that argument, that, that fear at the bottom of the government's heart, in a sense? Kara. And because Jeremy is from Oliver Wyman, and from the private sector, could I invite you to speak into this? Uh, testing. And let me just tackle some of the issues collectively. The role of the private sector currently is pretty minimal because even in the private nursing homes, in the private options, the largest payer is still the government. If you put out a couple of hundred bucks a month, you get what you pay for. And pretty much um, funding today is really to cater to physical needs, which much less emphasis on, these, on the really psychosocial um, aspects that Philip has emphasized is so important to the total or the really holistic um, uh, um, really care for persons. Um, and I want to take this issue around what Anita said about how the system is sick. When the system is sick, there, is, there are limited roles for civil society, for individuals to take action into their own hands and say, let's build our own nursing home. Right, that's not really the role of civil society. The role of civil society is to advocate, to make mainstream, to shift norms. Right? And we are a young country. Once upon a time, normal people didn't serve in the military, but we changed the norm. We made national service a rite of passage. Those of you who can find your uniform, please wear it tomorrow because you don't need to pay for an MRT that doesn't run on time or doesn't work. <laughs> Right? Um, but so, so to all the artists out there, mainstream some of these ideas around dignity, around human decency, what, what your issues are, bring them to the, bring them to the forefront. And let, me, and let me just tackle the last issue around it's too costly. Uh, one of the issues why Radha and I got into so much trouble with the government was because we declared that, that looking after seniors in single or in double rooms is too expensive as a flippant throwaway statement that was intellectually lazy. And like we said, what is too expensive? Is $10 too expensive? Is $20 too expensive? Let's, let's work out the numbers and as a society, as a government, figure out, is it too expensive? Right? And those are the sort of decisions that I would urge us as citizens, as active citizens, to be involved in rather than abdicate. And if all we care about is the, is the COE prices and the, and the rising property prices, then you get, you get the government you vote for. 
Can I just add on to that, please? Um, just to, uh, Jeremy, you're exactly right. Another lesson we learned from Japan, Japan is facing a huge fiscal crisis. It has, its, its internal debt is twice the, uh, the amount of its uh, government spending right now. And that is because the system is over generous. So we need to have collective conversations as a country on how much it is that we are willing to pay for. And can I just also qualify when, you know, of course there are poor people in Singapore, we don't have a poverty line, we don't know exactly how many, but we, we, we do acknowledge that. Can I also say that we have the lowest tax rates in the world for the richest? And, and so these are conversations that we should be having. Someone who earns $350,000 pays the same tax rates as someone who's earning $3 million. And please do not forget, Singapore also has one of the highest millionaires and billionaires per capita in the world. We also have a household domestic uh, household uh, income of $8,000 plus per month, which is one of the highest in the world. These are median household incomes. So, so we need to have those collective conversations as a country, and the government cannot do it alone. I mean, they, they are really in a tight spot there. I mean, you know, we have to decide that, that yes, if we want better quality care, are we prepared to pay for it? Um, I, you are assuming that um, looking after uh, the elderly is a cost item. But in fact, can we afford to have 680,000 women not in the workforce? I mean, you know, it costs $600,000 to nurture a Singaporean from childhood to adulthood. Just to clarify what I said, I was saying that the government sees it as a cost issue. And so we need to persuade them. Yeah, yeah, correct. But then you see, at the moment, 680,000 women are not in the workforce, and we have spent 600,000 per Singapore. This is wasted money in, the, in a sense that you, if you leave uh, sing, uh, families to kind of take up the pieces by themselves. And actually, to the point that uh, Anita made about family, that the families are still important, actually, it's not just that we take issue that the family is the first line of defense, but we take issue with the unsupported family as the first line of defense. And in fact, there are very few subsidies for home care. And, yeah. and it, they're very hard to get to. And I think um, I also want to add the point that, you know, we, we talk about the government having all these ideas and notions, but the people do too. A lot of people have the same kind of notions that it's expensive, it's this, I don't want to do it, and that, this, that, the other. And I completely agree that what it has, it's our civic duty to take care of our elderly. That just the same way that we take care of our everything else. We take care, we, we spend millions of dollars to create that big ass um, kindergarten, whatever the hell it is, a huge thing. And I saw it on the front news, I was like, hang on a minute, but we're the fastest aging country in this part of the world, but the, the kindergarten was really much more important. Really? I don't think so. I think sometimes we have a warped idea of what we're supposed to be taken care of. And we talk about Gotong Royong, Kampong Spirit, and all that. Well, Kampong Spirit also means this. And I think that the elderly, taking care of the elderly and that kind of care has been pushed to the side for far too long. And now it's coming into the mainstream and it makes us very uncomfortable because we really need to actually think about it. What do we want to do for the elderly? as a community, a society, and a nation. This is riding very quickly on what um, Anita has said. I think uh, it's about relooking at our priorities. So even within the healthcare budget, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, eh, Raza and Jeremy, I think uh, you estimated that only 3 to 5% is spent on, on long-term care. Yeah, so without actually busting the healthcare budget, can we relook at apportioning more of the budget to long-term care? Thank you. That's a very important I think we have a question at 14 and 8. Will you not address the queer? I will address the queer. I will take care of you, Eugene. <laughs> Got you, sister. <laughs> but you know what? It's a very interesting point that you raised because when I was actually in Peace Haven, we, uh, I was talking to the lady who runs it, the director, and we talked about what happens when people fall in love. You know, it was almost like, well, elder people don't fall in love. Of course they do. And I think that if we haven't even addressed that, we're very far away from addressing uh, what it is going to be like for a gay person to be in that healthcare system and elder care system. But I think it's time now to start talking about that. Just don't talk about it in just in uh, heterosexual relationships, you know? Let's talk about it very broad. 
Yeah, and it's good that you've brought it up because I think you might be the first person to ever talk about it. So thank you. But I'll take care of you. Me and, and Philip. <laughs> So, Eugene, am I allowed to move on to number 14 now? <laughs> Sorry to make you feel neglected. It's okay. <laughs> so you go. Um, I'm, actually, I'm going back to something that's been mentioned by a few of you, and this is about the care in Japan. Now, Japan is very... Um, I'm completely going away from what he was concerned about. Yes, um, Japan is very homogeneous not just culturally, but even economically, a rich person, a poor person, lives in a similar sort of way, in the way they eat, the way they live their lives. Um, in Singapore, we are very different, culturally, economically, socially. So what can we learn from the, from the Japanese experience that can be replicated in Singapore when we are so different? That's a very good question. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Do you want to take a few more for chewing? We could address that. Okay, sure. Um, you're very right. Culturally, socially, we are pretty, uh, pretty different, except the fact that we are Asian. But what we went to Japan to look at, and the whole Asian values thing, but what we went, really went to look uh, at Japan for is that Singapore, as I said, Singapore today will be what, uh, uh, Singapore in 2030 will be what Japan is today. It's right now the oldest country in the world, so we can learn from them. The second thing is they have an immense diversity of choices. You know, for, for instance, it's, um, you have uh, living for collective housing where you have uh, gay people, you know, who, who are welcome. So they have, uh, you, you have, uh, I, you have, take a look at Genki Kaki to just get a brief uh, glimpse of the, uh, the array of elder care choices they have. So that was one thing we were very interested in seeing. The second thing we were interested in seeing is studying their finances, you know, because they have made a lot of mistakes. What can we learn from their mistakes? So I, I personally think we need to, I mean, financing is a big, big issue, and, and we do need to look at long-term care insurance, and, and uh, you, you know, they, they are, have a very over-generous system, so, but we are right now at the other end of the spectrum, so what can we learn and how can we not not make their mistakes as we go forward but yes culturally and socially no we weren't there to learn learn that from them because i was just going with angela's slides just now to everything was chinese you know so it was catering to the chinese older person and we are more than just chinese in singapore so yes i i, I totally agree yes <laughs> <laughs> yes um, <laughs> And that is the signal that we have come to the end of the time for our Q&A. But I assure you that the audience, you may engage with the speakers and the commentators outside during break time. But right now, could we go to the scenario that we have prepared for you to consider tonight? Oh my God.
audience, on your seats, you will also discover a survey form. At the beginning of the performance, we've asked for your views. And right now, having heard the complex discussions that the discussants and the commentators have uh, given us, we would invite you to share your views with us again in this second survey. I ask that you complete this survey very quickly without thinking too much. And could you please return the survey to us on your way out to the break area?